Welcome again to our Bible study. This is the third of four, so we have one more week next week. We have been looking at Max Licato has a book called Before Amen, and he has a very simple sort of model for prayer, which has four parts. So it makes it easy to look at it in four weeks, in a sense. The four parts are to, to just kind of a simple model that you can uh, adopt if it's helpful for you. The first is, Father, you are good. The second is, I need help. The third for tonight is, they need help, praying for others. And then the last for next week is to say thank you. And so we have our materials again. Uh, would somebody like to read our introduction for us tonight? Liga always did a good job. Oh, we're Thank volunteering you, Liga. <laughs> Usually I don't let people volunteer other people, but if Liga wants to do it, that's fine by all me. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> we have all faced those moments when we come to the end of our own abilities to help the ones we love and care about. It is a humbling reality. Maybe our grown daughter is exhausted with the responsibility of raising three little ones, but there doesn't seem to be much we can do when we live three days away. Or we want to help a buddy battle a powerful addiction, but we have no idea how to free our friend from the razor sharp talents gripping his life. Or we are walking with dad through a long struggle with cancer and feel powerless to make things better. Or our work colleague is fighting depression and we are frustrated that nothing we say or do seems to lift her spirits. In these sobering moments, we realize we lack the power to heal broken hearts, infuse needed energy, restore ravaged bodies, lift emotional clouds, or multiply loaves of bread. In situations like these, we have to make a decision. One option is to give up. We acknowledge that our abilities are limited and our power to fix the lives of the people who love is not enough. We can quit. What do I have to offer? Uh, I am in way over my head. This is too much for me to handle. If we come to the end of our rope, we might find ourselves tempted to let go. Jesus offers us a better option. In these moments, and they come to every one of us, we can look up and cry out to God for help. This is called intercession. It is all about asking God to help the people we love and the people who are tough to love. Once we have discovered that God is good and loving Father, we not only ask him to help us, but we also dare to ask him to help other people because they need him too. Okay, very good. Thank you, Liga. So tonight we're going to talk about intercessory prayer. Last week we talked about something which may be very difficult for you, which is asking for prayers for ourselves and in a sense being honest before God. And uh, tonight we may, on the face of it, um, you know, express that praying for other people is much more natural and much easier. And yet it it is complicated too. Um, on the one hand, think of it in terms of extremes. So you could have the extreme of someone who believes that prayer does nothing. And so it's not a worthwhile enterprise at all. Or you could look at it on the other side and say, prayer really does everything. In a sense, if you need something because God is good, God will obviously deliver it because God is good. Um, that type of extreme, I think, to be honest, can be a little problematic, too, because we know that prayer is answered in a variety of different ways. And indeed, at times, seems like it's not answered. You know, we pray for healing for a certain person and we don't see it happen. Or we pray for a financial need and we, we still continue to struggle. So what, what I want to... Um, what I want to have us think about tonight is, is how it can be a little more nuanced and what is actually happening in prayer. I use this as a long explanation because I, I believe Pastor Lucado is kind of in the second camp that prayer can be very, very powerful and that we need to pray more often. And I think there's truth in that, but 
I guess what I'm saying is I, I think he does an excellent job in sort of introducing the topic, but much like any, much like any, you know, Christian leader or Christian writer, we are free to kind of interact with it and, and indeed, you know, perhaps uh, disagree with it. At times. So I don't know if that makes sense at all, but I just want to raise that before we watch the video because he, um, he presents some points that I, I think are a little more nuanced, but anyway, okay. Anybody have anything to say to all that? <laughs> now that I railed on for a while. Okay, you rail as much as you want. Think? We're here to learn from you. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I make the big bucks, right? Okay. Right. <laughs> I am glad. So, um, so yes, we're here to learn, and I think... Um, I do appreciate what he's written. So we're going to watch the video now, and then we'll have plenty of chance to talk about it. So I'm going to, first thing I do is I'm going to put a mute. I'm going to mute people, and we'll unmute after that. And then we'll share the screen with the video. And we're going to share the sound. Imagine that you are sitting at home when the phone rings. You pick it up and hear the distraught voice of one of your friends. And she tells you that the teenage son of a family in your church has just been killed in a car accident. The family is in a state of shock and you would do anything for them, but what can you do? It's a question you will ask yourself at one time or another. What can you do when you see yet another tornado has struck a city, demolishing homes and destroying lives? What can you do when you learn that a friend has been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness? What can you do when the challenge is greater than you are, when the hurt is palpable, when you feel helpless and impotent? Where can you turn? A missionary doctor named Helen Rosevere was faced with this type of question. Helen had spent 20 years in the Congo at a clinic and orphanage, and during her fourth year, a mother died in labor, leaving behind a premature baby and a two-year-old girl. The facility had no incubator or electricity. Dr. Rosevere's first task was to keep the newborn warm. So she sent a midwife to fetch a hot water bottle. The nurse returned with bad news. The bottle had burst when she filled it up. Even worse, that was the last one the clinic had. Dr. Rosevere instructed the midwife to sleep near the newborn to keep it warm. They would seek a solution the next day, but a solution was not easily found. The clinic was in the heart of the jungle and help was many miles away. The life of the newborn was in jeopardy. The following day at noon, the doctor mentioned the concern to the children, and, and she told them of the frail baby and the sad sister. They all prayed. But one 10-year-old girl named Ruth took it on herself to take the problem directly to Jesus. Please, God, she said, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. And while you are at it, would you please send a doll for the little girl's sister so she'll know that you really love her? Well, the doctor was stunned. The prayer could only be answered by the arrival of a parcel from home. In her four years at the clinic, she had never received a single package. Even if one did arrive, who would send a hot water bottle to the equator? Well, as it turns out, someone did. Later that afternoon, a 22-pound package was delivered to Helen's door. She felt the tears in her eyes as she called the children together. Could God have really answered little Ruth's prayer so precisely? They pulled off the string and unwrapped the paper. In the box, they found bandages, jerseys, raisins, sultanas, 
and a brand new hot water bottle. Next to the hot water bottle, there was a doll for the little girl's sister. The box had been shipped five months earlier. In Isaiah 65, 24, God tells his children, before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The Lord had heard Ruth's prayer even before the little girl had offered it. How many of us would have had the same type of faith? How many among us would pray with such boldness? How many of us truly take Jesus' words to heart? Ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. We all need God's help at times to fix the broken parts of our lives. So do the people around us. Just as God keeps his word and meets our needs, he will meet the needs of those in our lives. Again, all we need to do is ask, Father, you are good. I need help. So do they. And with these words, we intercede on another person's behalf and invite God to work a miracle directly in that person's life. That, my friends, is an awesome privilege and an awesome responsibility. One of Jesus' most intriguing teachings about prayer is found in Luke 11, verses 8 through 11. In this story, Jesus says, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. That's you, ringing the doorbell at midnight. The neighborhood is quiet, the streets are still, the sky is dark, and so is your friend's two-story house. But still you ring his doorbell. Not once, not twice, three times. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. It's a big house, so it has a big chime. His chihuahua wakes up. The dog has this snappy, who do you think you are, bark. Ruff, ruff, ruff. And you envision what is happening upstairs. Your friend's wife is giving him a kick beneath the blankets. Hank, get up. Someone is at the door. Poor guy. One minute he's sound asleep. The next he's being kicked out of bed. Hank is not going to be happy. The porch lights come on. The door opens. Boy, does Hank look like a mess. Boxer shorts, t-shirt, bed hair, face lined with pillow creases and whiskers. What in the world are you doing here, he asks. A friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, you say. I have nothing for him to eat. Can you help me out? Now, Hank grumbles and complains, but you insist. Come on, Hank, please. Finally, your friend invites you in and he takes you to his pantry and you fill a basket with food and you take it home. Your surprise guest doesn't have to go to bed hungry, all because you spoke up on behalf of someone else. This is intercessory prayer in its purest form, a confluence of paucity and audacity. Father, you are good. They need help. I can't help them, but you can. This prayer gets God's attention. After all, if Hank, a cranky, disgruntled friend, will help out, how much more will God do the same? He never sleeps. He's never irritated. When you knock on his door, he responds quickly and fairly. Jesus never refused an intercessory request, ever. Peter brought his sick mother-in-law. The centurion brought his sick servant. Jairus had a sick daughter. So did the woman from Canaan. He heard so many requests that the disciples attempted to turn people away, but Jesus would not let them. He never grew impatient at the requests. But he did grow impatient at the lack of one. It happened when a father brought his epileptic son to the disciples of Jesus. They attempted to help the boy, but they couldn't do it. So, when Jesus learned of their failure, he erupted in frustration. Oh, faithless 
and perverse generation. He said, how long shall I put up with you? How long shall I bear with you? Well, such an outburst. What was the oversight of the disciples? Well, simple. They never took the boy to Jesus. He had to command them to bring the boy to him. And Jesus had a strong word for this. Unbelief. Belief is pounding on God's door at midnight. Unbelief is attempting to help others without calling on Jesus. One of the most amazing stories of intercession is found in the book of Exodus. The Israelites had just sinned against God by doing the whole golden calf stunt and God was not happy. In fact, he was ready to wipe out the entire nation. Dry grass on Mount Vesuvius stood a better chance of survival. The people's only hope was their octogenarian leader. If Moses had any clout, this was the time to use it. And he did. He prayed. On his face one minute, he was in God's face the next. Pointing his finger, lifting his hands, shedding tears, shredding his cloak, wrestling like Jacob at Jabbok for the lives of his people. And how did God react? The Bible says the Lord changed his mind and did not destroy the people. This is the promise of prayer. We can change God's mind. His ultimate will is inflexible, but the implementation of that will is not. He does not change in his character and purpose, but he does alter his strategy because of the appeals of his children. We cannot change his intention, but we can influence his actions. After all, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the king and speak with the authority of the throne. Like a congressman, we represent a district. We speak on behalf of our families, our neighborhoods, our softball teams. Our sphere of influence is our region. And when God burdens us with a concern, we respond with prayer. Father, they need help. If we as ambassadors for God send our king a request, will he not listen? By all means. Intercessory prayer isn't rocket science. It simply acknowledges our inability and God's ability. We come with empty hands but high hopes. We come with the knowledge that he is able to do exceedingly more than what we could ever ask or think. That he supplies our needs according to his riches and pours the abundance into our laps. I have personally experienced the power of intercessory prayer in the life of our church. During the early 1990s when I was new to the Oak Hills congregation, I had an opportunity to visit Skyline Church in San Diego, California. The minister, John Maxwell, invited me to speak. I agreed in exchange for his best advice on how to build a strong and healthy church. Well, John was quick to give it. Prayer. He specifically suggested that I recruit 120 partners who would commit to praying each day for the church, my family, and me. When I returned back to San Antonio, I announced the plan to the congregation. Within a month, exactly 120 people had volunteered to form the team. Six months later, I was happy to send a report back to John about everything that had happened as a result. In just those six months, we had twice broken our record for Sunday attendance, we had finished the year with our highest ever average Sunday attendance. And we were now well over the budget. We had nearly doubled our staff and elders and witnessed several significant healings. Antagonism in our congregation was at an all-time low and church unity was at an all-time high. I was stunned. Our church felt God's wind in our sails. And all we had done was increase our resolve to pray for others. 
it's happening again during the three months I led our church through this study on prayer our giving increased well over budget every single campus group we again enjoyed our highest attendance ever even more we saw more people come to Christ than in any comparable period in the history of the congregation the explanation prayer as we redoubled our commitment to pray God redoubled his promise to bless us nothing pleases Jesus as much as being audaciously trusted when we bring people to Jesus he opens the pantry in the book of Revelation the Apostle John records his vision of heaven at one point he sees the prayers of the Saints ascending like incense into the presence of God an angel takes the censer of prayers fills it with fire from the altar and throws it to the earth instantly there are noises thunderstorms lightning and an earthquake behold the power of prayer you ask God for help and BAM your prayers are filled with fire and thrown down to the earth you lift your concerns to heaven and turbulence happens noises thunderstorms lightning and an earthquake so go ahead knock on the door at midnight stand up on behalf of those you love and yes stand up on behalf of those you do not Jesus instructs you to pray for those who hurt you the quickest way to douse the fire of anger is with the bucket of prayer rather than rant rave or seek revenge just pray Jesus did that as he hung on the cross father forgive them he prayed for those who had crucified him they do not know what they are doing even Jesus left his enemies in God's hand shouldn't you do the same you are never more like Jesus than when you pray for others so pray for those you love pray for those you don't pray for this hurting world present their case to the giver of bread father you are good I need help so do they and then bring a grocery basket for God will give you plenty of blessings to take back to them okay we're back together if you want to unmute yourself we'll start our conversation So pastor, pastor encourages us to, to pray more, which I think is a good thing. He talks about, you know, feeling helpless when people have very deep, deep. That's a good, isn't it? Are you, is somebody That's talking? From Trinity. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob. Hi, Bob. We can hear you on your microphone. Oh, <laughs> I got Carol here too. Yeah, it's very I don't know good. How to... oh, good. There should be a little button maybe to the side of the screen you can turn the video on. Start video. On our little on our little screens, a lot of times it's at the lower left. Yes. I'm using my iPad. My I, phone. I, iPhone. I forgot my iPad. Okay, well that's fine. That's mm -hmm. fine. We're glad that you're here. It is a good I'll be, reminder. I'll be quiet. No, it's fine. <laughs> we um just a reminder that all our microphones are really good. So anything that's said in the room, any background noise, we hear it all, which is fine. But just so you're aware of that, you can always sometimes when I have meetings, I'll turn my microphone off temporarily. But anyway, all that's fine. We're glad that you're here. Any any initial comments about the video? Excuse me? Was, was there something? Okay. I want to know why an unexpected guest showed up at this man's house at midnight. 
and why there was no food in the house. Most people have some food in their house. I mean, you know, for the family. <laughs> Do you think that was a was a real, actual, factual event or a story that Jesus told to make a point? Well, it was a story that Max was telling. It was suppose. Well, it, it comes from the Bible. It comes from the book of well, Luke. Yes, the bread, the guy knocking on yeah. the door and the man, the neighbor of whose door he was knocking on probably had to climb over the whole family that were all sleeping together in order to get to the door. And Yes, it's well, it's um yeah, it is in the book of Luke and he did amplify it a little bit. I think it was meant to be a contrast, sort of like, look, that'd be outrageous if you ask a friend, but even even that grumbling neighbor would help you. How much more will God help you? Don't you think that's the point of the story? Well, sure, that's the point the story is making, but yeah, it's I mean it's like a lot of stories, you know. Aesop's fables talks about talking animals, so sometimes they're hard to take literally, but let's think for a moment, just just step back for a moment, and think about intercessory prayer, which is praying, praying for other people, even praying for difficult things, you know, people who are sick or well, gosh, all sorts of big problems. So, so how many of you, show of hands if you're willing to, how many of you are, you know, have done that in the past, prayed for other people? Pretty, pretty much all of us. And, you know, I want to talk about some of our struggles with that, but, but I do want to talk first about, you know, why you do that and, and what you think, what keeps you encouraged as you do that. Anybody have an answer to that? Well, as a parent, you are sometimes you're you're helpless to be able to help mm -hmm. the adult child. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to ask for God's help. Carol and I are going to say goodbye. Okay, Bob. Good Good to, bye. Good bye, Bob. Bye. That's fine. Go ahead, so you Debbie. Keep, you keep asking yeah. for, for God's help for whatever the problem is. You know, for I'm speaking of my kids who I pray for daily. Yeah. Um, you know, in Aaron's case, he didn't answer our prayers, you know. Um, but uh, you know, but we keep keep asking. Yeah. Because okay. we're we're very um <clears throat> limited as to what we can do. Mm -hmm. you know so yes that's a Kevin, good example he will he will answer and he will try to help them mm -hmm. if they will let him if they will listen if they will hear the voice of the holy spirit coming to them yeah maybe that's part of it too and it was sad about aaron he had that he had that addiction illness yes it's just awful he had to be awful as a parent i'm sorry what about other people in their prayer life? Things that you, you know, reasons why you keep keep praying or things that you found about it. Well, back to what Debbie said in that. Yeah, I pray for my kids every day and stuff, and I'm always asking for God's gu guidance for them. Mm. To make correct decisions in their life. And mm -hmm. Yeah, we sometimes forget about those spiritual gifts of guidance or strength or even hope, um, not just things that we need, or even our health, but for some of those intangible things. You know, to be honest, this is something we struggle with sometimes too. So what are some, as much as you're comfortable being honest, what are some, you know, struggles that you have with prayers or questions about it that you find frustrating? Anybody feel comfortable sharing in that? Dean? Well, I find when he's talking or when I'm thinking about um, about prayer and intercessory intercessory prayer, um, 
you know, you just sometimes the problems are so big and you think mm. I, you know, God isn't curing my aunt's cancer or isn't saving the children in the Congo or isn't stopping the war in the Ukraine. Mm. You know, we, we um, I, I don't get disillusioned, but I get a little frustrated. Mm. Right. Like, like, why, why isn't this happening? Why yeah. isn't my prayer answered as to, you know, what I want? Yeah. Yeah. That can when, be frustrating. Go ahead. Sometimes I wonder if someone else has a different prayer for the same thing. So yeah. instead of, gee, I might want this person to be healed, but maybe that person just wants to have less suffering, but for the disease to progress. You know, so it's the same event, but but different prayers. So maybe the prayer is being answered. It's just not my prayer. Mm. It's a little more sophisticated. It can get frustrating. I, I think the war in the Ukraine is an excellent example. It's just such a sad, sad thing. So many people suffering. And even when it ends, their, gosh, their infrastructure and so much has been damaged. There are many things that obviously we understand that some of our maybe more selfish prayers, if I prayed for, you know, a brand new car or, you know, whatever, <laughs> that we understand why that wouldn't necessarily come true. But for praying for something which just seems like it makes sense, an end to suffering like that. It's not to say that prayer can't make a difference, not to say that it's not important. And I appreciate his en encouragement, but let's look at um, Let's look at some of these passages that he had us look at. The one is the one that Mary mentioned. Let's go to the first one, though, which is a pretty strong statement. The one, it's uh, John 14, 12 through 14. Anybody want to read that to us? I'll go ahead. Mm -hmm. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the work that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Okay. This is uh, maybe one of the most hopeful verses in scripture, maybe one of the most problematic. It's hard to, when it says that Jesus said this, and I guess we can believe that, you know, what are, what do are we do with this? Because, because we just know, you know, anecdotally that not all our prayers are answered. Very well-meaning prayers. The question here is written, if we really believed everything Jesus says in this passage, how would it impact the way we pray? So, you know, just looking at that, do you think if we had more, had more faith or believed that God could actually act or would act, believed in that goodness of God he talks about, do you think that we would pray more? I, know well, I think that if the more results someone sees, the more they're, the more positive results someone sees, they're going to keep on praying if it really works. I know I have struggles when there's not only the Ukraine, but we had the earthquake in Turkey, and then now there's war in Sudan, and you know this whole COVID mess. It's it's just overwhelming. It's just like yeah. you want to believe that that God is everywhere, but yet how can he not be overcome with some of this, mm -hmm. all this stuff? So I guess someone would really pray more if they saw more. Yeah, I think and yet there are miracles, you know, people do heal from diseases that are 
are diagnosed as incurable and mm-hmm. things of that nature, but it's maybe we just don't hear about it that often. Yeah, we don't. They certainly seem to be rare occasions. I mean, he tells a great story about the water bottle and the doll, and it's and it's undeniably powerful. And we, we love those stories, um, but uh, but miracles do seem to be still rare and not automatic in terms of our in terms of our prayer life. Yeah, I wrestle with this one, and I don't know if it's cheating to say that God does various things in prayer, that God answers prayer in various ways. Certainly, we don't get everything we ask for, though. So. This is one of the passages that I wrestle with, to be honest. And maybe what we're asking for isn't, you know, if it's just not meant to be because there's a greater cause or a better worth to something coming up by not answering our prayers. You know, we don't always have the other side of the story. I guess God has it. That's true. I think there's, we have to at some point reconcile our belief that God is good in caring, but there's also a lot of suffering in the world. Even the most basic suffering of of us getting sick and eventually dying, there can be great suffering, and it just is sort of cooked into the into the cake, so to so to speak. It's just how things are worked out. So, how do we reconcile those things? I think he does make a good point that that we can. <laughs> We can be encouraged to pray more and, and trust in God more. <clears throat> here's 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 where I wrestle. Um, in, and sometimes you hear this theology where basically says um, God is good, so God is going to give you what you what you need or what you want. And there's a flip side to that, which is basically if you are not a strong enough Christian or if think bad things are happening in your life, it's because you're not a strong enough Christian and you're not praying enough or you're not, you know, you're not making it happen yourself. And that's very dangerous theology because obviously very good people suffer and wrestle with things. And we've all lost loved ones and some of us very tragically. So we have to be very careful in some of that becomes what's called works righteousness which is we have good things in our life if we're good enough people and god rewards us for that well that's we know god cares for us even in the midst of our brokenness so i don't know if this lesson is encouraging or not to you but it is it is complicated i think let's look at this uh, uh verse that mary he had uh, the story from Luke that he extrapolated a little bit. Uh, somebody want to read the verse from Luke 11? Where are we? Luke 11, 5? Yeah, that's it, John. That's <clears throat> good. happens. And he said to them, <clears throat> suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up, and give him anything because he is his friend at least. Because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Is that it? No. Well, there's a little bit more if you want to, or I can finish it. Oh, oh, that I thought that was great stuff. So I say to you, ask it, it will be given to you. Search and you will find, knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. <clears throat> if there's anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish, or if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, 
who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay. I think that should, yeah. That's it. That's it. Rather strong saying at the end. So I think that's how I'm going to end my sermon on Sunday. If I'm going to, I'm going to say to you, if you then are evil, know how to give, give goods to your children. Whoa, that's pretty strong language. <laughs> I think the point is to encourage people in their persistence in all things. That's certainly that perseverance and that persistence is a is a gift in life when you have to be, you have to keep at it sometimes. And, and it's specifically in terms of prayer to not get discouraged, even if things aren't working out immediately. How does that story strike you? Anybody have any feelings or thoughts on that? We don't know uh, if we're praying for a loved one or even a friend or whatever. We don't know how many steps that person has to go through to get to the place, you know, what other lessons he has to learn that God would want him to learn, mm -hmm. you know, to get to this place of doing something else or not doing something else or whatever. Yeah. You know, there may be a lot of other learning that needs to go on you know, before they, they get there and before, and God knows this. Yeah, you're saying learning so, can happen in the midst of struggle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I think we, we have all seen that in our own lives and in the lives of others we love. And also, we don't know um, God's timeline. You right. Know, because we ask right. for something, it doesn't mean that it's going to be answered tomorrow or next week or next year, his timeline might be something entirely different. I think but we, so we have to have that persistence to keep asking. This is something that people, people wrestle with. And yet, you know, like most of us, we, we continue to pray for others. There's a marvelous book that I was reminded of. I don't think we ever did a study on it. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, Philip Yancey is one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called Prayer Doesn't Make Any Difference. And it's a very, it's over 300 pages. So I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I do want to read a little section because he talks about what happens in intercession. And his, his argument in this little piece is that intercessory prayer, in fact, changes us. It allows us to see people and the world as God sees it. And uh, let me just read a little section here because I think this is really good. Yancey writes, God is looking, he's talking about the body of Christ. God is looking for a beachhead of presence in the world, a body we might say, and indeed that's the very image Paul seizes upon. We are the body of Christ. We have formed a partnership to dispense God's love and grace to others. As we experience that grace, inevitably, we want to share it with others. Love does not come naturally, I must say. Uh, in prayer, in order to place myself within the force field of God's love, allowing God to fill me with compassion that I cannot master on my own. So I pray for other people, not necessarily because I have deep feelings for them, but, uh, but in fact, the prayer gives me compassion and helps me to understand so he goes on to say, this way of viewing the world changes how I pray for others. Crudely put, I once envisioned intercession as bringing a request to God that God may not have thought of. Isn't that an interesting idea? God, you may not know that my son is wrestling with this. No, we're not making requests to God that God may not have thought of. And then he goes on, then talking God into granting them. Now I see intercession as an increase in my awareness. When I pray for another person, I'm praying for God to open my eyes so that I can see that person as God does and then enter into the stream of love that God always, already directs towards that person. Uh, just a little more. In short, prayer allows me to see others as God sees them and me as uniquely flawed, uniquely gifted bearers of God's image. I begin seeing them through God's eyes. 
as beloved children whom the Father longs to embrace. I know what God wants their marriages. I know that God wants their marriages to grow stronger and their children to stay out of trouble. God wants them healthy and strong to resist temptation. I bring those prayers to God because I know God wills the very same thing. What I desire in the people I pray for, God desires all the more. And then he concludes that section. Once I catch a glimpse of another person through the eyes of God, I feel a prod to respond as part of Christ's body, God's incarnate presence on earth. And of course, what changes me does change the other person. I begin to treat my neighbor and relative in a different way, tinged by God's grace. I write my troubled friends notes of encouragement and ask how I can help. I pray for those in other countries who work with prostitutes, prisoners, and orphans, find myself digging deeper to send financial help. Nothing spurs compassion in me like prayer. I, I think that's really beautiful, and I think there's there's a lot of truth in that. And certainly I've prayed for a lot of needs of others where I, I have felt helpless or, or I haven't done anything, but I think it has changed me at times and spurred me on to try to find ways to help, even if it's just to offer like you said, a, a card of encouragement or, you know, a phone call or whatever. So how would you feel? Would you feel worse if you didn't pray thing or won't do any good? Or if you, if you prayed and tried, I mean, you can't, if you pray, you know, you have the faith. Yeah. So you can't just say, well, but you can't help them all pray. You know, if you don't pray, then that could be harder on you than if you pray. Yeah. Uh, don't see any results. I think you're right, John. And we are we are praying people. <clears throat> Part of the hope that we have that God is not done in the story. I do a lot of praying with people as people are dying and, you know, in the hospital. And honestly, sometimes they're still praying for healing when the person, you can really see that they're dying. There's nothing any of us can do. And, but there is something, something hopeful and obviously an end to suffering is an answer to prayer too. You don't wanna see anybody suffering. All this is meant to be an encouragement for you to continue to continue to pray and continue to talk to each other about our, you know, about our, um, about our moments of faith, but also moments of doubt and struggle. It's okay to struggle. And even the, I think we've talked about this before too, but even the great superstars of the faith, whether they be the Apostle Paul or Mother Teresa or whoever you can think of have had kind of these moments of struggle and doubt. That's just part of the, part of the thing too. Anybody else have a thought at the moment? Well, with these uh, lessons and uh, stuff that we've been going through, I one of the things that we had said, I think it was last week, about saying your prayers out loud, which mm -hmm. I never have done before, and that, and uh, and praying for myself, which I was. Wasn't good at doing that. And so I, you know, started changing my ways. Did you, um, did you try that this week then? Yeah. 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 Did anybody else try, try anything different this week? You could say no too. It's okay. <laughs> we are a work in progress. <laughs> I think that's a big start. I think it's, it, again, I think praying for ourselves is in a way being honest with God. God, I'm I'm struggling with this, that, or the other thing. Finances, health, bad thoughts, whatever it is, asking for God's help. And again, uh, some people are very comfortable praying out loud or, or doing sort of spontaneous prayers. Other people need a little help. So that's why we have devotional books and all sorts of resources and books. 
and prayers and such. I like his simple little prayer. You know, the prayer. Oh, I can't find it in front of me. I always blank on it exactly, but oh, it's Father, you are good. I need help. They need help. Thank you. Amen. Just a very simple little prayer device. I don't think we need to go through each and every question. Anything else anybody wants to talk about tonight? That's about it for me. I'm just glad to get together. Well, when down south, um, my new brother-in-law's sister, um, 16 years ago, had a tumor the size of a baseball in her colon. Wow. And she was, you know, very sick with it. And she's a, a devout um, Pentecostal. And the whole church prayed for her. And I, I don't know, I can't remember if they did laying on the hands and so forth. And that tumor disappeared. And it's wow. gone. And she's still alive now here 16 years later. That is amazing. So that, that was a miracle. You know, right. she believes in that. And I believe. Yeah. You know. And that, that's something, you know, God does answer mm -hmm. some prayers. Or over here you had so many people praying all at once, you know, mm -hmm. is that more powerful? You know, if you have a group like that, praying for one person. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. but that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Well, let's close out tonight with the Lord's Prayer. We'll do it in our muddled way together, but it's good to be together. We pray, Our Father, Father who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy be name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy will, thy be, will done be done on earth, on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us Give this, us this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our trespasses, our trespasses as we as forgive we those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us not to temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom the power, and, the power, power and, glory, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank we'll you. Okay, thank you. We'll see you on Sunday. Okay. Bye.